its very nature, boxing is a sport full of individual personalities. They draw us to the fight game as much as the battles that take place in the ring. But much of the texture of the sport comes from the people that don't always get the attention. The referee who has officiated dozens of championship bouts involving the biggest names in the sport and always has the last word. The trainer, manager and brother of one of the best flyweights in the world who has not forgotten his roots. The boxer who manages his own business is a dedicated family man and fights for titles all while remaining one of the best people in the sport and the ring announcer, the GQ kind of guy, who says those words that get us ready for the fight. So stay with us as we introduce you to some of boxing's unsung heroes. Hi everybody, I'm Al Bernstein and welcome to this ESPN Boxing Special. Tonight we're going to take a look at four of the unique personalities in the sport of boxing. You know, among the people that make their living at this sport, some do it full-time, some do it part-time, but they all share one thing, a passion for the sport. Now among boxing officials, one of the most compelling personalities belongs to a Reno District Court judge, who in his spare time just happens to be one of the best referees in boxing. His name is Mills Lane. And he's made this phrase very popular. I get it out! For more than 20 years, those words have told boxing fans that the waiting is over and the fight is about to begin. Lane has been the man in charge for more than 70 world championships. The list of fights he's worked over the years reads like a who's who of boxing. Ollie Foster, Holmes Norton, Barkley Duran, Tyson Ruddick, Bo Holyfield. Well, you get the idea. But the ring isn't the only place Lane is in charge. Come to come down, please. Lane is a district court judge for the state of Nevada. That's his full-time job. But not surprisingly, he finds his roles in the courtroom and the ring to be very similar. As a judge, I am an impartial referee, if you will, in cases or controversies. That's kind of a sophisticated word to say disagreement. In a prize fight, the disagreement is more basic. I mean, it's a fight. But I am still, a, as a referee with a blue shirt and a black bow tie, I am an impartial observer making decisions and making sure that the protocol of the fight, or the fight is fought according to protocol. Again, another warning and maybe taking a point. Yes, they are. It's like in the courtroom, my primary job is to make sure that the truth-finding process, the integrity of the truth-finding process, is not compromised to the best of my ability. Mills Lane has been around boxing all his life. As an amateur boxer, he made it to the finals of the 1960 Olympic trial. He turned pro after the trial, but soon found out he didn't have the skills or the chin to make it in the pro game. I go out and I remember, bam, I remember going down the first time. I remember the other two times. I remember I get to the corner and they give me the ammonia, so I look up and I said, well, uh, what happened? He said, I've been looking for a little bit I said, you mean I knocked him out that quick? <laughs> that experience convinced Lane that he was better off pursuing a career in justice. The boxing was still in his heart, and he looked for a way to stay in the ring. Well, boxing was good to me, and I always wanted to keep my hand in. When I got out, when I, when I realized that was as far as I could go, or as far as I should try to go, I wanted to either be, to keep my hand in so I could either be an official, or own a fighter, or be a promoter, or be a matchmaker. Well, I wanted to be an official, so I took up that friend as a hobby and worked at it in the prelims and finally got a big break in 78 with Holmes and Norton, and after that it was pretty much uh, Katie by the door. When we come back on Boxing's Unsung Heroes, Mills Lane recalls some of the big fights where he had the best seat in the house. bugs me that I waited to try Old Spice High Endurance just because I thought all deodorants worked the same. Dumb. This proves it's the best. Better than the leading stick. It evaporates less quickly, lasts longer, protects better against odor. You can't ignore that. Or this guarantee. Try it. 
If you don't think it's the best, call 1-800-PROVE-IT and they'll buy you a stick of yours. You gotta figure anyone that serious about deodorant deserves a serious shot. Come on, take the high endurance challenge from Old Spice. I did. So I'll chance them. When it occurs to me, I wouldn't mind hitting one of those fashion TV shows in Paris. You know, I'd find out what's in, find out what's out. That'd be cool. And who knows, maybe someone over there would appreciate the enduring qualities of a true Canadian lager. Hey, trendy colors come and go. Me? I prefer blue. We've only been to the instructions one time. This is with the championship of the world. Great feeling. I expect a tough, clean fight. Great feeling of being right there in amongst it. Any questions from the challenger? Any questions from the champion? Always say when you're fighting for the title, I put the big apple on the line and I'm in the middle of it. Let's get it on! After all the hype is done, after the crowd has sat through half a dozen undercard fights, it's time for the main event. And you can feel the excitement around the ring. And though he is the picture of control during the bout, Mills Lane has great enthusiasm for the fights and boxers he's seen. The walls of his Reno courthouse office reflect some of the greatest hits during his career. Back when I boxed Mike Tyson, the instructions, I think, before Tony Tucker. Kenny Martin, one of the great guys, great people in boxing, got stopped by me shooting when he got hit in the body early and was in real trouble throughout the fight. About the second round, he couldn't make it. Marvin Hagley, when he beat him out of front row, I thought Hagley won this fight. They gave it, they called it a draw. Hagley, one of the complete packages, could have been a competitor in any era of boxing. Great fight. That fast Muhammad Ali, the interesting thing about that fight is all three of those fighters was in the 1960 Olympics. Bob Foster was a middleweight, I think the first night. He won the whole thing as a light heavy, and I got beaten in the finals uh, as a welterweight. All three of us lined up in the same room in 1972. Twelve years before that, we both, all three fighters were Olympic trial in 1960. This is the, the parachutist for after in Winnie Bowl, Holyfield 2. My job was to try to keep some semblance of going in the 20 minute time period when the guy parachuted in, the fan man, and uh, the fight. I never could figure out, I thought the guy was a prankster at first, and late on I found out he was just an idiot. Holmes Norton, a lot of folks have said one of the great heavyweight fights of all times. Larry Holmes was at his best that night. First heavyweight championship fight, the second big fight I ever had, it was split cotton the whole night. Nervous as hell. Great fight. As a referee and as a judge, Mills Lane has led a life of achievement. He's quick to credit boxing for giving him a start toward his goals. Boxing got me uh, situated right in the Marine Corps. It got me the University of Nevada. It got me open doors so that would not be open otherwise. It, it gave me a, a vocation, which is a great deal of fun. When I take the bow tie off and no longer have to be a referee, I'll leave something behind. But I hope that my uh, love affair with the sweet science goes on in some other capacity. Is Bill's Lane. Mills Lane knows what it's like to try and keep two careers rolling. Another man that knows that is the man we'll look at next here in our look at people in boxing. His name is Terrell Brazier, and he just might be the most special person I've ever met in this sport. Advil for today's tough pain presents Profiles of Courage. In the 91 Canada Cup tournament, Wayne Gretzky received a vicious cross check from the USA's Gary Suter and dropped to the ice in complete agony. That was the beginning of Gretzky's lower back troubles, which made him sit on almost half of the 92-93 season. But 93-94 saw Wayne make a strong return, leading the NHL in scoring for an incredible 11th time and surpassing the legendary Gordie Howe as the all-time leading goal scorer in the NHL. In a clinic like this, I can't stop for a headache. The doctor here told me about Advil. It's tough on pain, and it really works fast. In fact, one Advil is as effective as two regular strength Tylenol. And for cold and sinus congestion, there's Advil cold and sinus. It's tough on colds, like Advil is on pain. And now it's available without a prescription. Advil, a new Advil cold and sinus. Tough on pain, tough on cold congestion. Among athletes, the ones that are faced with the most misconceptions are boxers. 
every week, one of the best part of my jobs is I get to sit and talk with five or six boxers as we interview them the day of our ESPN top-ranked boxing fights. And by and large, I have found almost all of them to be great guys, men that raise families, face the same concerns that you and I do, and make their living in a very tough way. And perhaps the man that epitomizes that is Harold Brazier. This warrior from South Bend, Indiana, is a terrific guy. He has never won a championship in boxing, but believe me, he is a champion. Harold Brazier has been in the ring for quite a while. This South Bend, Indiana native is a veteran of well over 100 fights. He's had his ups and downs, but Harold is known to everyone in the boxing world as one of the nicest guys around. How nice? Nice enough to buy a car from. You might if you lived in South Bend and needed a new set of wheels. That's right, Harold loves cars, but he's more interested in selling them than buying them. The car business isn't something new for Harold. He's been working ever since his boxing career began. Well, I've always heard that, you know, most boxers didn't, bo uh, didn't work on the side and uh, work full time. Uh, they just trained boxing. Uh, I heard that after I got into it, and, uh, uh, but I didn't know anything else. But to work first, take care of my family, and then train when I get a chance to, in the evenings or in the morning, or even in the afternoon, I would run. If you're a casual boxing fan, you may not have heard of Harold Brazier. He's not a candidate to headline any pay-per-view card. Brazier began his career back in 1982, and since then he's been a busy man. Harold has fought no less than six times a year since, with good success. He's had a couple of world title shots, and he's held the NABF and IBF Intercontinental belts. And that success can be attributed to hard work. The same kind of work ethic that has made him successful in his other career. Harold began his automobile career by working in an auto body shop. Now he's moved over to the sales department. And with his personality and work ethic, he's very comfortable with his other occupation. I've been in the car business all my life. Uh, uh, what, what better part of it than uh, fixing them is, you know, is really buying them. You know, everybody from 16 to uh, 80, 90 years old have to have a car. And I know a lot of people, they know about me, they all want a salesman, they know and they can trust. Most people know my uh, track record through boxing, my lifestyle. So uh, they come to me to get a good deal, a uh, fair price, and uh, get an honest salesman. You might think combining two extensive careers and a family would be almost impossible, and you'd be right. Just like the Army, Harold does more before 9 a.m. than most people do in a whole day. Get up about 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. I run four or five miles to outside, and then if it's bad, I got a treadmill, I run indoors. Uh, I get up, I, I shave, shower, get ready to go to work. Uh, I prepare myself to get all my uh, paperwork and stuff ready, to go to the office, and, uh, uh, and my prospects and the deals I'm working. I work them diligently during the day, and then at 6 or 8 o'clock at night when I get off from work, uh, I come home, I help guys come over to my house in my basement, and we train, or I train by myself two or three hours, and then uh, I try to spend a little time with my wife and kids, and, and then I crash. And so then I get up the next morning, the same old thing. Handling a family and a career are often a strain for most people. So just think of how tiring it would be to add a second career. How does Harold handle it all and still have success? The answer is a boundless reserve of energy that keeps him going in everything he does. Then I found out that uh, be champion in the world, one of the key things were to help in this energy. And that's one of the things I've been blessed with, you know, so I can do all those things, work, train, uh, spend time with my family. Harold has had a successful boxing career, but he hasn't let it dominate his life or his other profession. If you ask him, cars and counter punches have come to coexist quite nicely. Uh, just like in boxing, selling cars uh, uh, with your family, you have to make the situation work, you know, and uh, I've made boxing work so far. Harold Brazier's days as a boxer may be numbered, but believe me, the impact he'll make on all the people that have known him in this sport will linger on for a long time. When we come back, we're going to take a look at a guy who has helped his brother become a champion, but he's a champion too. We'll be back with a look at Danny Carbajal. Stay with us. 
Introducing the new Accord V6. family associations in the sport of boxing, one of the few that has really worked. It's the home of Michael Carbajal, flyweight champion, and the home in which he and his brother Danny both grew up. Danny is now his manager and trainer, and together they have taken Michael to the heights in boxing. But it's a mistake to think that Danny is not his own man, because he is. In his own quiet and forceful way, he makes his presence felt. We just work well together. It's everything um just comes together, um, you know, Danny does his part and I do my part. He does all the business and, and, and all the training part and we just get along with each other. We've always got along, you know, uh, as, as a family, as, as brothers. We never, uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think about, you know, like father-son relationships or brothers in, in the sport. We just held it as, as, as brothers and then separate brothers from trainer and boxer. Since Michael Carbajal captured the silver medal in the 1988 Olympics, the Carbajals have helped put small fighters back on the pro boxing map. Fighting in the 108 pound junior flyweight division, Michael ripped through the competition to capture an NABF title just two years after the Olympics. He continued his rapid climb with his first world title just five months later in July of 1990. His success has made Michael one of the most recognizable fighters of the 90s. His bouts with Humberto Chiquita Gonzalez have developed into a growing rivalry that draws global attention and audiences as well. And while the man with the little hands of stone is basking in the ever-growing spotlight, his brother Danny has quietly handled the training and the day-to-day -day details. Happy to let Michael have the glory, Danny remains modest about success that he never imagined. I never thought about it as a career. It was just, just for, I, I liked it, and that was it. I had another brother, Alex, who wanted to box also, and I, I started to work with him. Uh, but, you know, this sport is, is, is difficult. You have to have a lot of dedication to it. And for Alex, it, it started out okay. I mean, afterwards, he just, you know, oh, I, I don't want to train today. I don't, I'm okay, fine. You know, and so let's leave it alone because it's not that it's not for you. And then Michael came along. And he was there every day. He couldn't wake me up sometimes. Careful not to disturb the drive that has pushed Michael to greatness, Danny discovered an effective training style. In a sport full of big egos and volatile personalities, Danny's ringside demeanor might best be described as laid back. There you go. All the time he tells me something, it always works. So um he just a lot of knowledge and um, when I come back to the ring he, he come back to the corner all the time he's very very relaxed and um, he just studies to see what the guy is doing and, and all the time he tells me to do something it works you, you pick up different things from everybody every trainer has something that they do that they teach to everyone and you see it on film and you pick it up it, uh, there's not there's no trainer that can tell me that he done it all by himself because every trainer learns from everybody else. For all their success in the ring, the Carbajals have remained true to their roots. Still living in the Phoenix neighborhood where they grew up, Danny and Michael have established Carbajal's Ninth Street Gym in an old church a couple of blocks from their home. 
Michael trains there every day, along with an ever-growing stable of fighters who are now under Danny's management. And they include former world champ, Louis Espinoza. Training world-class fighters is one purpose of the 9th Street Gym, but the facility has another mission as well. As soon as school bells ring, there the gym is, invaded by kids from the neighborhood. This is something that we thought about since after the Olympics, and um, the main thing was to keep the kids off the streets, and um, I think, uh, you know, I was thinking about that because uh, the boxing, and when I trained in the backyard, um, it kept me away from the streets and kept me off the trouble. In an era where reestablishing family values seems to be a priority, the Carbajals have never lost theirs. Danny and Michael have kept their feet firmly planted on the ground in Phoenix by not letting their success in the ring interfere with the values that their late father instilled in them. Basically, everything is, is patterned after the things that he taught me to live, how to live. Uh, you know, he said, uh, you have to be able to, to, to trust each other. You, there's there can't be nothing uh, in the back of your mind questioning is, is, am I doing right for my brother, is my brother doing right for me? Uh, you, you have to have a complete trust in each other and know that every time we do something, that I do something, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for, for, for the benefit of, 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 of Mike because I don't want nothing to happen to him. Danny Carbajal, a man filled with humility, but a man who's achieved a lot in the sport of boxing. And I dare say he'll continue to achieve well after his brother Michael has retired from the sport. When we come back on Boxing's Unsung Heroes, you'll meet Michael Buffer, a guy who dresses sharp and has a great line. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Rosie, the place looks great. Yes, it's it awesome. is. It was. Here. Uh-uh. New Bounty's the only one I use. Paper towels are all the same. New Bounty's the quicker picker-upper. It's quilted. Hey, that's fast. And watch this. I'll take Bounty and the leading brand and look. Bounty absorbs more per sheet than the leading ordinary paper towel. Wow. Now, watch while I scrub this counter. With an abrasive? See, even wet Bounty is stronger. Hey, the ordinary towel falls apart. I'm convinced. Now it's Bounty for me. Rosie, pass the Bounty. Hand off. Touchdown. Bounty scores again. New quilted Bounty. It's the quicker picker-upper. Now it's here in Canada. And Mr. Sun, first thinking is what we are. Welcome back to our look at some of the unique personalities in the world of boxing. Well, if you watch our ESPN Top Rank Boxing Show every week, you're used to seeing a tall, handsome, gray-haired gentleman in a tuxedo. No, I, I didn't mean me. I meant Michael Buffer in the center of the ring. He's a man that says, let's get ready to rumble. And everywhere I go around the country, I'm always asked, what is Michael Buffer really like? Tonight, we're going to show you. You know, boxing is a sport full of intriguing personalities. And sometimes it seems as if everybody has their own gimmick to try and separate them from the crowd. And it's not easy. Being a unique personality is tough enough for the fighter. But how about for a ring announcer? Well, Michael Buffer has found his hook. And these five words have made him famous. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Because I'm a fan, I wanted uh, that excitement to reach out as if I were sitting there. We have a great fight and the electricity and the fighters come out and their music is playing. Everybody gets excited and then the ring announcer has to kill the crowd by saying, This bout is sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Chairman, Dr. Elias Gano. Commissioners. It goes on and on and it kills the crowd. So I wanted something that when we introduce the fighters, and you get that excitement back, and even the fighters would get excited. Something that just gets the energy back into the introductions. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! My 
Michael Buffer is a part-time actor and a full-time ring announcer. And while it seems as though he's been around the sport forever, he only got started a little more than 10 years ago. And then, only on a whim. My son actually watched a, a ring announcer screw up a split decision, do it in an undramatic way, and he said, I hate that, Dad, why don't you do that? And I thought, well, yeah, why don't I? So I just thought maybe for laughs I could do it. Since then, Buffer has been a fixture at big fights by introducing us to the fighters and making the outcome official hundreds of times. Now that job can become pretty routine until the microphone quits working. Barkley Duran, definitely one of the great, my, my favorite fights, the best fight I ever sat at at ringside. The sound system went out, but it was the PA system. Now I didn't realize it, of course, that the microphone was hot on the airwaves, but the PA wasn't on. And uh, from what I understand, they got some letters from people that know how to read lips as to what I was saying when I started yelling at the uh, production assistant at ringside, you know, changing microphones and nothing seemed to work. Drama building here. His microphone work, you know, they can't get it working for him. I ran Barkley. So what we did was I gave the scores screaming as loud as I could with Bob Arum on one side and Jay Edson on the other, yelling it out to the crowd. And a crowd of 6,000 people all shut up just so they could hear the, crowd, the, uh, the voices with people yelling it out in the way system. Well, what started out as an impulse has turned into a career for Michael Buffer. It's great work if you can get it, but don't plan on this job opening up anytime soon. No, this is a full-time job for me, and uh, it's become a... a you know, I make a good living at it, and I'm very happy. And uh, 10 years from now, let's take a hike, you know. I'll be almost 30 by then. I guess Michael Buffer is the epitome of what we've tried to show you during this program. Some boxing personalities with a twist. We hope you've enjoyed this look at four unique people that populate this sport. I'm Al Bernstein. We'll see you next time.